Hi, uh, it's Jim here. Uh, this is the lecture on right heart catheterization. Just a brief introduction to right heart catheterization. Please note the disclaimer at the front here. Uh, these are the learning objectives, which I hope will be realized during this talk. This is a right heart catheter. In fact, it's a Swan Gans catheter. And uh, it's a balloon tipped catheter that's used uh, to measure the pressure within the right side of the heart. So this is the balloon tip, which is inflated using this syringe here. In this particular catheter, there are two different ports. There's this port, which is the distal port and allows pressure, transduction, withdrawal and introduction of uh, fluid to the tip. And this is the proximal port, which essentially releases uh, in the case of measuring cardiac output by, by thermodilution methods allows us to introduce fluid at this point here. Uh, there are many synonyms for the uh, right heart catheterization process. People talk about a pulmonary artery catheter, uh, we talk about right heart catheterization and this uh, particular model is based on the uh, technology developed by Swan and Gans. So why would we uh, do right heart catheterization? What can we learn? Well, it allows us to measure the pressure in various chambers of the right heart. For example, the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the pulmonary artery. It allows us to measure the cardiac output, specifically right ventricular cardiac output. But in the absence of any shunt within the heart, then the right ventricular cardiac output should be the same as the left ventricular cardiac output, at least over time. It allows us to measure what is referred to as the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, or some people call it the wedge pressure, which is a synonym for the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. I'll explain that. Essentially, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure approximates left atrial pressure, which is the most important determinant of left ventricular filling pressure. That's assuming that there's no pulmonary vein gradient. So, how can we use the information? So, we talked about what we can measure, but how is that useful in patients with cardiac disease or suspected cardiac disease? Well, the classic example is this, if there's shunt. So if we have a shunt in the heart, there's a... So if we have a shunt in the heart, uh, there's a hole and blood can leak from one chamber to the other. For example, if there's an atrial septal defect, there's a hole between the left atrium and the left... Sorry, in the right atrium. If there's a ventricular septal defect, there's a hole between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. If there's a persistent patent ductus arteriosus, there's a hole between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. By measuring the saturation uh, between the different chambers, it's possible to estimate the location of a shunt and the degree of the shunt. So this is a very important use of right heart catheterization, very important in evaluating patients with congenital heart disease. Another very important role of the right heart catheterization is in the estimation of valvular heart disease. For example, if you had a right-sided lesion, for example, pulmonary stenosis, it's possible to measure the pressure gradient across the valve directly. However, for left-sided valve lesions, the classic one being mitral stenosis, we use right heart catheterization to assess the severity of the mitral stenosis based on the back pressure through the right heart. And this is essential in deciding who should be treated with surgery and the timing of surgery. In patients with heart failure, we're able to assess the filling pressures within the uh, right ventricle and particularly the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. If the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is elevated, then we say the patient is volume overloaded or wet. And if the, pulmonary artery if the pulmonary occlusion pressure is low, then we say the patient is dehydrated or dry. We can also directly assess the cardiac output, albeit at rest. The right heart catheter is also very useful in establishing in the critically ill patient the different forms of shock. In other words, we can detect and differentiate between cardiogenic shock and, for example, septic or hypovolemic shock. So the right heart catheterization is a very useful tool for the cardiologist. In general, right heart pressures, at least in health, are very much lower than left heart pressures. If we accept that the cardiac output in health for a 70 kg male at standard temperature and pressure is 5 litres per minute, we know that the cardiac output in the left and the right heart will be the same. Saying that, if we know that the pressures are lower within the right heart, 
that implies that pulmonary vascular resistance must be an order of magnitude lower than systemic vascular resistance. So when we're looking at, right, at heart failure, we look at right heart pressures and also very importantly the cardiac output. So for example, if we're in the congested state, the right atrium will be high, the right ventricle will be elevated, and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be elevated, essentially due to back pressure through the right heart. In looking at the various forms uh, of the uh, waveforms taken uh, during right heart catheterization, the most complex form, and the one that I'm going to emphasize most, is right atrial pressure, which is essentially the same as jugular venous pulsation. So we have an atrial, ventricular, X and Y descents. And I think it's important that you should be able to draw these and sketch these. Right ventricular pressure tracings look very much like the left ventricle, but are at much lower pressure. If there's significant congestion, then right ventricular pressure will have to compensatorily increase. Pulmonary arterial pressure looks like the aorta, and again, in a lower pressure system, the absolute values are lower. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, as I mentioned, is essentially pulmonary arterial occlusion pressure and correlates with left atrial pressure. If the patient is congested, then we we'll expect a rise in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. This is the tracing of a right atrium uh, in a patient with a degree of heart failure. There's several things to notice here. Firstly, this is the respirometer or the variation in, in respiration of the patient. You can see the pressures vary according to inspiration and expiration. Secondly, you can see that the right heart catheterization pressure, the right atrial pressure in this case, is a complex waveform. So if we look at this in a little bit more detail, we said that we have an X and Y descent, which correspond to the opening of the valves. You have A wave, which consists, consists corresponds to atrial contractility, and you have the C wave, which is the closure of the tricuspid valve. And as I said, it's worth being able to trace these, tra big, these uh, pressure tracings. This is a patient in whom we performed right heart catheterization. This particular patient has uh, a lot of things going on, but let's just talk about what we can see. We can see pacemaker leads. This is a right atrial lead, and this is a right ventricular lead. Now, if you look really carefully, can see that there are echo that there are uh, radiolucencies here, specifically stents within the left anterior descending artery. This is the balloon tipped right heart catheter or Swan's, Swan Gans catheter in this uh, setting, and this is the pressure tracing derived from it. So you can see here the tip of the catheter sits within the right atrial chamber, and we get this characteristic right atrial tracing. In the same patient, we advance the catheter to the right ventricle. So, from the point of vascular axis for this patient, the swan gans catheter is introduced from the right internal jugular artery, jugular vein, which is up here, and the catheter goes through the right atrium and then into the right ventricle, in this case, the right ventricular outflow tract. The catheter is then advanced across the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary outflow and into the proximal pulmonary artery. And this is beyond the uh, pulmonary valve, so we get a uh, pulmonary artery pressure tracing, which is very similar to aortic pressure tracing, of course, an order of magnitude lower. And finally, this is what this is what a pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, pulmonary wedge pressure, will, will look like. It's where the catheter is inserted all the way into a side branch or a small branch of the pulmonary artery, and the balloon is inflated to occlude flow behind it. And based on this pressure tracing, the absence of pulmonary venous stenosis, which is said is extraordinarily rare, the pressure measurements correspond to left atrial pressure, which is the most important determinant of left ventricular filling. So this is just a whistle-stop tour of uh, the pulmonary artery catheter, uh, and I think and I hope you'll agree that it can be useful in the assessment of patients with complex cardiac disease. A word on the complications, which are rare, but they can include arrhythmia because the catheter is being introduced into the heart and the right ventricular outflow tract is particularly susceptible to uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Bleeding, including pulmonary hemorrhage, which can be fatal. Vascular access site complications, which can include uh, bleeding, hematoma, fistula, and finally infection, particularly if the catheter or the introductory, the introduction sheath is left in. Thank you very much.